Hello and welcome to the next episode of the groundbreaking research at the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at Wisconsin. Last Monday, Millard Sussman taught us, told us about the work of Brink, which was uh, with corn and identified jumping genes at about the same time and about the same way that Barbara Placentak did it. Today is our usual program. The talk is current work derived from this earlier work. And the speaker is John Dobley, Professor of Genetics and Medical Genetics. Pleasure to have you, Dave. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. <coughs> I'm glad Dave made the distinction between the groundbreaking work of Brink and my current work, which uh, I make no claim of being uh, groundbreaking. Um, but I am going to sort of walk you through maybe 40, 45 minutes of what we've been trying to do in my lab um, to understand the genetic basis of one of the most remarkable, or probably the most remarkable case of a crop domestication. A, a domestication that um, <clears throat> involves really profound changes in morphology, and yet we um, know that it just happened by genetic changes in our attempts to try to figure out what those genetic changes were. So the talk is featured on the um, genetic architecture, which just means the numbers of genes and how big the effects those genes had on traits that differ current modern maize from its wild ancestor, and um, what were the molecular mechanisms <clears throat> by which those genes changed, which we mean did they have an amino acid substitution or was there a change in the way they were regulated? Isn't it my Laser stick's not any good, but oh, here's one. Good. I think this one will work. And I have this subtitle, um, Low Hanging Fruit and Dark Matter. And the low hanging fruit is the stuff we can grab and understand. And yet, we know there's a lot we don't understand, and not, but I'll say something about it, and that's the dark matter. So let me introduce you to the plants. This you hopefully recognize, that's modern corn. Usually has just a single stalk. Real modern corn has just one ear on the side. You've probably all had some sweet corn or popcorn. This is a side branch. It's a very short side branch and it has a female structure or ear on the tip. And this is the wild ancestor of corn. It looks reasonably similar as a plant, but it's very branched. It has lots of side branches, some from the base and some from all the way up along the stem. If we just look at one of those side branches, it'll have a tassel or a male structure at the tip, and then it has a bunch of little ears along the side. And so what is happening is this tassel in this ancestor, Teosinte, is replaced by an ear in modern maize, and all these little ears have kind of disappeared. There's just one big ear at the tip. And all of these branches are gone too. You just have that single, very short side branch. <clears throat> A couple of things going on here. This actually is what wild plants do often when they are grown out in the, out in the open with lots of sunshine. They branch profusely. If you took a teosinte plant and you shaded it by lots of other plants, it would get unbranched too. So plants respond to their environment by either branching a lot or not branching so much. And if you think about it in another way, this has, for a wild plant, it's got lots of tiny little ears, that's fine. But if you are a farmer and you're going through your field to pick your corn, do you wanna to have to pick two or 300 little tiny ears off the plant? Uh, or would you rather just get one giant ear that is just as much grain, but in a single easily harvested unit. And so what ancient peoples did is they converted this with lots of little tiny ears, difficult to harvest, into a crop that has one giant ear, very easy to harvest. Now as different as the plants are, <clears throat> the real difference is the ear. So that's an ear of modern maize, sort of, a very, tiny little ear of modern maize. And this is an ear of teosinte. And just to give you a, a little bit of more of an understanding of it, I'm gonna pass around the cup 
It has these little triangular shaped, what we call fruit cases, that make up the Teosinta ear. You can see there's just about a half dozen of them there. They're all hooked together here, actually with crazy glue, um, but uh, they naturally break apart because each one has a single seed and that's how the plant sows the seed for the next generation. Each one of these has a single seed and that goes and flies off to a different location. A lot of times birds eat them, they'll pass through the bird and then get planted somewhere in a nice pile of manure and um, start the next generation. Here all the kernels are on um, the cob uh, as you typically find with me. So you can actually touch some of these teosinte uh, kernels or fruit cases in here. I'm going to put in a little ear of corn too for a comparison. If you like, you can keep some of those uh, teosinte fruit cases. I've got uh, bushel bags of them. Uh, there aren't so many in there, but um, you uh, can stick one in your pocket. They might even grow, so if you want to try it in your garden, um, you can do that. Now, here's a little more about these two different structures. <clears throat> and I'll explain that further as through. You don't actually see the seeds here. The seeds are hidden on the inside. And this, these are some specialized casing that surrounds the seed. Here, the seed is visible on the outside. There's no casing. And so what actually the transformation of teosinte ear into maize ear involved it involved turning the teosinte ear inside out. Okay, sounds rather dramatic. You had to bring the seeds to the outside and all of the tissues that make up the casing surrounding the seed, they form the cob on the inside. So essentially you had to turn the, the ear inside out. You can see why this is very hard to believe. In fact, for a long time, no one ever believed that teosinte could be the ancestor of maize because they look so different. And so they didn't want to believe that these uh, primitive farmers 10,000 years ago could, by selective breeding, convert that into this. <clears throat> Here's a little more about that teosinte fruit case. It has two rows of kernels. There's a row that points out this side and then a row that points out that side. Here's a cross section through an immature one. You can see the young developing kernel in there. Uh, if you crack one of these open, there's the kernel inside it. So there are just two rows of kernel. Corn has at least eight rows of grain. Modern corn can have 16 rows of grain. That has this protective fruit case surrounding the grain. The ear itself shatters because any, like any wild plant, it wants to shatter and disperse its seed. And there are only about eight to 12 kernels, where modern ear of corn will probably have four or 500 kernels on it. So that's much different from most other crops. Uh, this is wild wheat, and that's cultivated wheat. Pretty easy to see. This one is long and slender. It just got a little more compact. The grains are a little bit larger, but they're pretty much the same. Here's a wild tomato, uh, and here's a cultivated tomato. It's the same structure, just change in size. So it's very easy to think that this could be converted into that, but it's very hard to think that teosinte could be converted into maize. The same principles at hand, though. If you were picking tomatoes in your garden, would you want to have to pick 200 little tomatoes off the plant, or would you rather just grab one big giant one? It's much faster if you just can get one big giant one. So easier harvestability. So as teosinte, the ancestor of maize, is native to Mexico and Central America. It comes in different flavors. Uh, I think there are about five different species, maybe six, depending on who you want, who you, whose species names you like. Most of the places it grows are in southwestern Mexico. We did a evolutionary tree using DNA sequence data to understand the relationships among different types of maize. So that's a phylogenetic tree. This would be like corn from the Andes Mountains, corn from South America. Here's corn from Highland, Mexico, corn from Eastern United States, corn from Southwestern US. These are all the different types of corn grown by the Native American peoples when Europeans first arrived in the New World. So those types of corn uh, were collected from the Native American tribes, been preserved in germplasm banks, and we could get them and study their DNA. <clears throat> and then using the DNA, make a, 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 a genetic tree of all the different types of corn. And we included a couple of teosintes that are right here at the bottom. They have some strange Latin names we don't need to worry about. 
But what you'll see, here's all of corn from all over Latin America, or the New World, and it all comes from one branch point, which is right here. And at that branch point is this green, which is a type of teosinte. So all of corn arose from one single evolutionary event from this green type of teosinte. This is another type of teosinte, and down at the bottom is a third type of teosinte. We could also use our DNA sequence data to apply something called the molecular clock, which is you can basically get a time in calendar years that two species diverge from one another by counting the number of DNA sequence differences there are between them and knowing the rate at which DNA sequences, sequence differences arise over time. So our molecular clock data uh, date was 9,200 years ago, which is about what the archaeological data say as well. So <clears throat> if we go back here, oops, sorry, for one second, there are a few types of this teosynthase here shown with stars that are the ones closest to corn. And if we look at where they are on the map, this is a map of Mexico. Uh, this would be Mexico City right here. They're just southwest of Mexico City. So the genetic data suggests that the teosynthase that are most like modern corn come from this region southwest of Mexico City. And that's why we think that's the area in which um, corn was domesticated about 9,000 years ago. And as luck should have it, as I'll show you in a slide, that's where the oldest archaeological corn comes from, too. If you uh, go down to that region of Mexico, which I've done several times, um, here's a, a small hill. And all along over this hill, you see these plants. That's teosinte. And we collected teosinte there. You can see some in the foreground. We hiked up to the top of the hill. It, took us a, it doesn't look that big, but it took us a couple hours to get there. And um, there are just millions and millions of teosinte plants on that hill. Uh, when we get to the top, if you look out over the landscape, it's just hill after hill after hill covered with teosinte. So this was a tremendous resource for peoples 10,000 years ago. Each of those plants produces hundreds of seeds, and if you could collect them and eat them, you had a lot of grain to use in your diet. So my thinking is that that's what was going on. They were taking advantage of this very uh, productive wild plant as a food, a, a gathering for a wild food, and then over time they converted it into teosinte, or converted it into maize. <clears throat> Here's some cobs from the archaeological record. If you go, the oldest co cobs from uh, this particular site are 6,000 years ago, and that's a very small one, and that's exactly about the same size as the little yellow-eared one that's in the cup I passed around. And then through time at that site, they get larger and larger and larger, and this would be about the time when Europeans first arrived in the New World, and basically at that point, it's the same as modern corn. All of the sort of real changes to corn to make it the crop it is today took place before modern breeders got their hands on it. And again, what they're doing, again, uh, instead of har harvesting hundreds of little ears, now you could go to each plant and harvest one giant ear. <clears throat> so what the Native American peoples did with corn is just remarkable. So, Teosinte comes from here. At the t this is corn culture in ancient America. At the time that Europeans arrived in the New World, it was grown everywhere from Canada down to Chile. Now that's a really remarkable plant breeding feat if you think about it. Taking this plant that comes from tropical Mexico and adapting it to grow in Canada adapting it to grow at 3,200 meters up in the Andes Mountains, adapting it to grow in the deserts of southwestern United States. They bred it in just so many different ways. Uh, it's, it's astounding. In the Amazon uh, basin, Amazon forest, they grow it there too. So the native plant breeders of the New World were, uh, I have another lecture I give. They're probably the best plant breeders in the history of the uh, human species. So the New World people really knew how to make a crop. These are the archaeological dates for those regions, and the oldest archaeological date 
as luck should have it, is right here where the uh, teosinte grows and where our DNA data said maize was domesticated. And you can see it gradually disperses. So it's about 2,500 years ago in the eastern United States, a little later in the Andes Mountains. <clears throat> Give you a couple of pictures of what um, they did. So this is maize in the Guatemalan highlands. This is my PhD thesis advisor. His name is Hugh Iltis. He died a few years ago. He was a professor of botany here on our campus. I was a graduate student here and I took biochemistry with that guy. Um, <clears throat> and um, Hugh Iltis is around six feet tall, and he has his hand on the stalk. His ear is about 15 feet above the ground, and the plant is, my estimate, is something like 22 feet tall or 24 feet tall. So this is how corn looks like where they adapted it to grow in the wet forest of the trap, uh, Guatemalan highlands. It grows for about 11 months. You know, it just grows and grows and grows because they've got a very long season there. The, post, or the stalks of it are so strong they can use them for like a building material, fence post or whatnot. So they've got very strong stalks. Now this is out of a book. <clears throat> this is corn in the Arizona desert on a Hopi Indian farm, Hopi Indian reservation. And taken in about 1900. Uh, this is USDA scientist. His name was Collins, and he collected corn there. You know, but you, you almost think that must be a cactus or something, but it's not. It's very short compared to um, our, the one in Guatemala. It's a different adaptation by plant breeders. One of the remarkable things about it is they, um, there's not much moisture in the desert, but where the moisture is is very deep in the soil. So they bred the corn that they can plant the seed 12 inches into the soil and it'll grow up after it germinates through the 12 inches of soil and get the seedling will come out above. If you took modern corn like we grow in the Midwest and you put it 12 inches ground down, it would germinate, but it would get about three or four inches and then it would die, it'd never make it all the way up. So they bred that to um, adapt to the uh, desert. <clears throat> And then just to give you one more sort of slide uh, on uh, corn diversity and how variable it is. This is corn from a single farmer's ear in Mexico. We were down there collecting. We'd be out talking to the farmers. They have bins through, full of corn and we just asked this guy, he let us take a bunch, arrange them in a nice circle and take a picture. You can just see all the color diversity that's there. And when you heard about Brink, you might have heard something about these color variants on corn kernels. Well, these are the people, uh, these ancient farmers and modern native farmers of Latin America who selected all of those. There's one other story in that regard. They, you heard about transposable elements. And there's a story from the anthropological literature in the New World. And they had corn that had transposable elements, so the kernels were striped because one form of transposable element causes striping in the kernels. An anthropologist, having no, nothing about knowing nothing about corn, interviewed the people and wrote this in her book. She said, "Well, what's the one with the stripes?" And the uh, people she was interviewing said, "Oh, those are the most special of all the corn. We put one seed with stripes in every field." <laughs> so they would have been, in a way, promoting more mutation because they were spreading around the uh, transposable elements. They really miss nothing. You know, if you think about it, you spend all your time like this, right? Um, these people had just had nature, and they knew it in great depth in a way that we can hardly appreciate, let, let alone ever equal. So back to Teosinte. How could you make Teosinte in the corn? Well, this is the guy who figured it out. Uh, if you're a biology major, you may have heard about the one gene, one enzyme theory. Uh, I can make a Wisconsin connection. George Beadle shared the Nobel Prize with someone that Miller talked about, a, uh, I guess a few weeks ago, uh, Joshua Lederberg. So they, sh they shared the Nobel Prize. Beadle got it for one gene, one enzyme, along with a guy named Tatum. And Beadle also was interested in corn evolution. And he um, proposed that teosinte could be converted into corn by a relatively small number of gene changes, mutations. And Beetle did a little work to support his idea. 
he said, well, you can cross corn and teosinte, and that's the F1 hybrid, that's what it looks like. And the fact that they're crossing is a sign that they're not so different. And he studied the hybrids, and he saw that the hybrids were fully fertile, which is what you would expect if they were closely related species. Right? And um, you can cross a, a lion and a tiger and get a hybrid, but the hybrid's not fertile. Right? But here, the, the hybrid is fully fertile. And he did some experiments to conclude that there were maybe about five genes. And here's the Beatles experiment. <clears throat> and he used basic Mendelian logic. He said, if I take corn and cross it with teosinte, I get the F1 hybrid. And then I self-pollinate the F1 hybrid to get an F2 generation. What you're going to find is a quarter of the offspring are, for, if there's one gene difference, a fourth of the offspring will look like maize and a fourth of the offspring will look like teosinte, and half will be somewhat intermediate. This is a, a one to two to one ratio, which is basic Mendelism. So he said if there's one gene that's responsible for making maize and teosinte different, I should see a fourth look like, of, of the F2 plants should look like maize, and a fourth look like teosinte. If it was two genes, 16th and a 16th. And he came up with a number that was somewhere between four and five, and so he suggested about four or five gene changes could make teosinte in the corn. Basically, when he looked at his F2s, he saw that somewhere around one in 500 looked like maize and one in 500 looked like teosinte. And these are just some F2 hybrids to show you the, what the range you can get. You get some back F2s, that's an F2 plant. So it looks just like teosinte pretty much, a little odd there, but it's pretty much a teosinte. And here's an F2 that looks pretty much like corn. Here's an F2 that looks pretty much like maize, a very sh short stalk. And here's an F2 that looks pretty much like teosinte, a very long stalk with a tassel. And so that was Beetle's experiment. <clears throat> I should mention one other link. Oh, I want to go back for a second, because this has another Wisconsin connection. This is from a book written by a guy named Paul Mangelsdorf. And how many of you know the name Sarah Mangelsdorf? She's our provost. Sarah Mangelsdorf is Paul Mangelsdorf's granddaughter, and he also worked on corn evolution. But, okay, no, I'm not being recorded, am I? Uh, anyway, her grandfather was wrong and Beetle was right, so. Uh, and, um, and she actually fully accepts that, so. All right, so that's where Beetle left it. A few genes might make corn and teosinte different. <clears throat> And uh, that was about 1972, was when he sort of pub last published on that. Now what my lab has done is tried to say, well, what are the genes? Can we find the genes that differ between corn and teosinte and see how they've changed? <clears throat> and the way we did that, so we use a fancy word or phrase for corn, we or for a gene, we call it a quantitative trait locus, QTL for short. It's really just a gene. Um, and if you think about a trait like, say, how tall people are, it's quantitative. It goes uh, from very, you, people can be short all the way up to extraordinarily tall, right? Four foot 11 up to seven foot six or something. And so there are many, many genes that make those difference. So the trait is quantitative, and a, tra a gene that affects uh, a trait that's quantitative is a quantitative trait locus or gene. And most of the traits that make maize and teosinte different are quantitative. So we took this approach of trying to hunt for quantitative trait loci that make maize and teosinte different. And this is a little cartoon that shows you what we found. Corn has 10 chromosomes. That's the numbers 1 through 10. And this just shows you the kind of map along the chromosome. So it's got like map positions from 0 to 200 and something. And these gray peaks show you where we found evidence that that part of the chromosome makes the plant look different, corn from teosinte. So right here, this is chromosome one. On the long arm of chromosome one, that peak tells us that somewhere on that region of chromosome one is a gene or maybe many, several genes that make corn and teosinte different. So we did a genetic mapping experiment, mapping QTL for the differences between corn and teosinte, studying an F2 population. Basically, we did Beetle's experiment but we used uh, DNA from the chromosomes to track where the genes are located. I'm going to tell you about a few of these peaks and what genes are under them and what we learned about them. And I'm going to start here with this peak on this end of chromosome 1. 
And this is work done here by a graduate student in my lab. Her name's Laura Shannon. She's now a professor at the University of Minnesota. And um, Laura did QTL mapping. She was sort of our lead person on a big QTL mapping project. And one of the traits that she studied is whether you have lots of little ears, like Tiocinte, or just one ear, like maize. And here are some plants from her population, uh, which is, a, the population is a mix of corn and teosinte. And here's one that looks more like maize, just one ear. And here's one that's, it's mostly maize, but it look, has the teosinte trait. It's got lots of little ears along the branch, but it has a ear rather than a tassel at the tip. So when she asked, where's the gene that makes this, or the genes that make this different on the chromosomes, here's chromosomes one through five. She didn't find any genes on chromosomes 6 through 10, but she found some genes on chromosomes 1 through 5, but there was one gene with a really, really big effect. And this y-axis measures the size of the effect. You know, is it something that really makes a difference? And so what you can see, she, it looks like there's one gene that's really, really important here on chromosome 1, and then some other genes that are having an effect, but very little effect. So then this is David Wills. He was a um, postdoc in my lab. And he said, let's see if we can figure out what the gene is there on that long arm of chromosome one. And so he created a bunch of genetic stocks. And each row represents a genetic stock and that differ from one another in how much maize and teosinte they have. So this is a genetic stock, and in that region of chromosome one, it has maize all the way up to here, and then there was a recombination or crossover event, and then it has teosinte chromosome there. Here's another one that has teosinte chromosome here, but then switches, becoming maize chromosome, and so forth and so on. So he created all these genetic stocks, and then he looked at their plants for them, and here's what he found. These stocks produced lots of ears. These stocks only produced two ears. These stocks that produced only two ears are maize in this region of the chromosome, where the ones that produce many ears are teosinte in that region of the chromosome. So the part of the chromosome that gives you many ears versus just a few ears is right there. It's just upstream of ORF as an open reading frame for a type of gene that is called a transcription factor. That's a gene that controls other genes. It's a regulatory gene. And the open reading frame is the part that makes the protein. And this is the part that tells you when and where to make the protein. And so he found that what's happening is that maize and teosinte differ from a regulatory region in a gene that controls other genes. Feel free to interrupt with questions, too. So I didn't invite you to do that, and I apologize. OK. <clears throat> this is a collaborator at Clint Whipple. He's at Brigham Young University. And he did another experiment for us, which is to say, if we can figure out how that change in gene regulation took place, telling you that where the difference is is in, in controlling when and where the protein is made, and he, Clint did something called a tissue in situ hybridization. This is actually a side branch of a genetic stock that has the teosinte version of that gene. And this is a genetic stock that has the maize version of that gene. <clears throat> and so this is the side branch. So there would be an ear right at the tip here, or an ear formed right up there. And what you can see, or supposed to see, there's a little band of gene expression here. I won't go into the technical details of how we measure gene expression. But here again, the maize allele, you see a band of gene expression right across the nodes. And in teosinte, with the teosinte allele, you don't see that band of gene expression. What the gene is doing is it's the node is where a side ear, a little ear, would be made. And when the gene comes on here, it blocks the little ear from being made at the node. So what we got was a gain of expression in a particular tissue, these nodes, 
And when the gene is expressed in those nodes, it stops the plant from making the little side ears, so it just makes one big giant top ear. So we've identified the gene, a transcription factor, and we've identified that what has changed is how it's regulated. So now the gene is turned on in maize in a place where it's not turned on in teosinte. <clears throat> okay, let me give you another example. This is on chromosome four. This is our QTL map again. We found QTL on chromosomes one, five, six, and four, but we found one big giant QTL, something with a big effect on four. This trait here is making a fruit case. So we measured making a fruit case like teosinte or no fruit case like maize. Uh, these are the people in my lab here who did this work. Wai Wang, he now is a biotechnologist with Monsanto. Uh, Tina is a high school teacher. She was a technician in my lab. And Kirsten Bumbleys is a research scientist group leader at, in England at the John Innes Institute. So I should, she's also a MacArthur Genius Award winner. So she's uh, quite a remarkable young woman. So they, uh, as a team, uh, clone this gene uh, that makes the fruit case. And it's another regulatory gene. It's another gene that controls other genes. And here's what it does. So here's a normal teosinte ear. Here's one in which by just back crossbreeding, we substituted in the maize version of this gene. And I, I didn't mention its name, but I'll mention it now. It's called TGA, is the name of the gene. And when you substitute, here's a normal teosinte fruitcase, when you substitute in the maize version of the gene, the fruitcase doesn't fully develop, so the kernel becomes partially exposed. Now, if you're an ancient person and you want to eat the grain, wouldn't you much rather have it out there easy to get rather than locked up in there? And so this was probably a very important step in making teosinte a more edible crop. I'm going to point out one more thing I'd like to point out. Think about teosinte, wild plant. It's got its seed locked up in this fruit case. How can it grow, right? It's got to germinate and grow. It has a system for doing that. This is a little pore that the root comes out. So the, this will imbibe water. The seed will germinate. The root will come out that little hole. And then the shoot will come out on this crack up here. So it's adapted to protect the seed, but then leave it kind of an escape hatch when it, when it germinates. So and I point that out because I'm going to show you another slide where you're going to see that little hole again. And here it is. So this is the opposite form of back cross breeding. We took the teosinte allele for that TGA gene and we put it into modern maize by back cross breeding. And now it makes little fruit cases all within the corn cob. And it does it so perfectly, it even remakes the little hole where the root will come out. So that single gene has a huge effect on development. And this is Jerry Kermuckle. He was a genetics professor in this department. And he, in parallel to me, uh, discovered uh, this TGA gene. And we published a paper together describing it. So we studied the DNA of the gene, the how it differs from maize and teosinte, and that's Zhang Zhao. She was a graduate student here in my lab. She's now a, uh, a statistical, uh, uh, what's her full title? She's a, a statistician with a pharmaceutical company in New Jersey. So, and Joan did the DNA, or the, what we call molecular evolution, and she sequenced the maize and teosinte copies of this TGA gene and compared them and found that the only place they differ is for one amino acid. So maize has an asparagine, and teosinte has a lysine. lysine. So one amino acid change is what makes maize and um, teosinte different. And this is a fancy pants complicated experiment, which I know that is probably too much to try to go through. So I'm not going to do it. I'll just say it in words. Uh, it's, these are really great experiments. If you like science, you'll like this kind of stuff. But, um, what it told us is that that single amino acid change from a lysine to an asparagine 
converted the protein from an activator into a repressor of its targets. This is a regulatory gene. It's a gene that run, you know, re regulates other genes. And that single amino acid change switched it from being a gene that kind of upregulates other genes to a gene that suppresses its targets, reduces their expression a little bit. And that's the fancy pants experiment that did that. And this is another fancy pants experiment. I, again, I don't, this is a gel shift assay. I'm not gonna uh, go into this, but basically when you have a, a, a polypeptide, they can sometimes exist as a monomer, one copy, but other times they will bind with an identical copy like themselves and form a dimer. And so what that amino acid does at this level, here's maize and here's teosinte. In teosinte, most of the protein is as a monomer, but when you switch it to maize, most of it's as a dimer. And so we think that single amino acid change is affecting the monomer versus dimer balance of the protein, and that's affecting whether it activates or represses its target genes. So. You have to be a science nerd to love this kind of stuff. I mean, I just really like it, so. Um, <clears throat> this is Y. Wang again. And Y did some other experiments. This is our gene that controls the fruit case. And he said, well, what are the target genes that it controls or activates? And so he identified a series of gene downstream genes that it uh, controls or activates. And he, this is just several of them. And as luck should have it, they're also regulatory genes. So this gene sits atop of a kind of a regulatory cascade. It's like a regulatory gene that regulates other regulatory genes, and somewhere down the line are genes that actually carry out the work of cells. But, and this is, I don't, again, want to go into too much, but here you can see when you have the maize allele, the amount of expression, a product, of the target gene is lower than when you have the teosinte allele. So if you have the teosinte allele, you make a lot of this ZAG1 target. When you substitute in the maize allele, that single amino acid change, you repress the target. Okay. One more, let's see, I'm about, yeah. I'm, okay, uh, one more peak. I'll go through this one pretty quick. This is the peak for being a very branchy plant or just having a single stalk. It's on chromosome one. Uh, this is my technician from Minnesota. I did this work when I was in Minnesota, uh, where I was a professor before I came here. And uh, we cloned this. We did it actually using what Miller talked about, transposons. We did this by an ancient technique called transposon tagging. Um, and um, so here's Teosinte, very branched. Here's modern maize. And this is a mutant of modern maize called teosinte branched, TB1. So it's a gene that when you knock out this gene, a corn plant looks just like teosinte. So this right here is 100% modern corn. It's just got one of its genes knocked out and it makes it look like teosinte. Again, teosinte has a tassel at the tip of its branch, a male structure. When you knock out this one gene, you get the same thing. It converts the ear into a tassel. So it's a pretty remarkable one gene change. So we cloned it. Oh, and it turned out to be another regulatory gene, another transcription factor. So there's kind of a developing theme here that transcription factors are the genes that control what the plant looks like. So what this gene does, <clears throat> it blocks the outgrowth of branches. It's a repressor of organ growth. So this is another tissue in situ hybridization. This is a young seedling. This would be the growing tip of the plant. So this would just be a little seedling like this big. Um, and it's a, a cross section through it. And it's been stained so we can see where this TB1 gene is expressed. And it's expressed in the bud. So that's the bud that would grow out and make a branch. But when it's expressed in that bud, it represses the outgrowth of the branch. And so what happened in evolution then is this gene was not on in that bud. And so the branch grew out in teosinte. In maize, the gene got turned on in the bud and stopped the branch from growing out. And this is just the experiment to show you that. We measure 
how much is this TB1 gene expressed? And when you have maize in that bud, it's expressed a lot. But in, if you have a Tiosinte allele at the gene, then the, bud is, the expression is much lower. And without going into the details here, the way this gene works is it turns off the cell cycle. So the, it doesn't, the bud can't grow out because the gene is the TB1 gene represses genes involved in cell division. Ooh, I'm going to skip. So we, well, this is uh, Tony Studer. He was a grad student in my lab. He's now professor at the University of Illinois, well, assistant professor. And this is Richard Clark, who was a postdoc, and he's now an associate professor at the University of Utah. And um, they said, well, we know that TB1 gene was important, but what part of it? What part of that gene changed? And they were able to map the part that makes maize and teosinte different to 60,000 base pairs away from the part that makes the protein. So here's the part that makes the protein. 60,000 base pairs upstream is the part that makes maize and teosinte different. And it's another regulatory region, so it controls when TB1 is turned on and how much it's turned on. So up here is something that's telling the gene that you've turned on a lot higher in maize than in teosinte. And they could measure how much of an effect it had. When you get rid of all the other genes in the genome and you say, how much effect does this one little change in this region have on the plant? Well, it would take, if you took a plant that was pure maize and you substituted in this control region from Teosinte, you would get a plant with two little branches like that. So, <clears throat> um, I can mention transposable elements again. So it turns out what was the key change in that gene is a transposable element. It's a transposable element, has a clever little name called hopscotch. And um, in maize, hopscotch jumped into the control region in Teosinte, the hopscotch is not there. And then this is another fancy pants experiment. And basically what it tells you is when hopscotch jumps in, the target gene gets expressed at a much higher level. So the hopscotch element is an enhancer. It's enhancing the expression of the open reading frame for the TB1. When you get more of this TB1 protein, you're repressing more repression, so you get less branch outgrowth. All right, so that's the low-hanging fruit. Uh, we can get the fruitcase gene, we can get the many ears gene, we can get the branching gene. We've done five genes like this. All five are these regulatory genes called transcription factors. In four cases, it was changes in the regulation of the transcription factor, and in one case, it was amino acid change. <coughs> I'm going to skip because I'm running out of a little time. We did some other experiments. I'm not going to give you the details of them. And I told you this already, that the TB1 branch gene regulates the cell cycle genes. I told you that the fruitcase gene regulates a bunch of target genes. But we also figured out that the, this gene, the branch gene, controls also the fruitcase gene. And then the branch gene also controls the many ears gene. And there's, from the literature, several other genes we know about that are all part of this pathway. There's something called a microRNA that regulates that gene. And then we know all of this is downstream of the shade avoidance pathway from plants. So when you are getting lots of shade, then this gene is turned on, turned off, and that makes TB1 go off. And so in this condition, you can get lots of no branching. And in this condition, uh, when you've got not shading, then you do get lots of branching. So this pre-existing sort of developmental pathway, in a sense, was hijacked by uh, these ancient peoples to convert the highly branched teosinte into the unbranched maize. And of course, I don't want you to, I don't expect you to remember, remember any of that, except to say that um, the, without all the names, just remember that evolution targets 
pathways and networks of genes all simultaneously. Why we can tease it apart and study one gene at a time, what's really going on is you're, you're targeting the entire genetic network controlling the traits all at once. Now that's the low-hanging fruit, just to make sure you understand we don't, under, we don't know all the stories. I told you earlier on, Teosinte has two rows of kernels. Maze has eight to 16 or so rows of kernels. If you study that trait, you don't see one big giant QTL. You see a total of 24 QTL, all different sizes. And the fact is the 24 is the, a statistical estimate that's going to be an underestimate. The real number could be 300. Okay. And so when there are all these other peaks like that, that's the dark matter. So we can find a few big genes of large effect, but finding all these little genes will be essentially impossible with current methodologies. But they're, they're out there. There is a lot of, if you will, dark matter controlling the trait differences between corn and teosinte. And um, this is Zach Lemon, who was a grad student in my lab. He now works for a company in Massachusetts in biotechnology. And um, Zach did a different type of dark matter study. He looked in the genome for genes that are differentially expressed between maize and teosinte. Let's find genes that are, say, expressed high in teosinte but low in maize, or low in teosinte and high in maize. And when he did that, he found over a thousand genes that are different between corn and teosinte in the extent to which they are either expressed higher or expressed low. And the most of them were in the ear. And the ear, of course, is where the action is. That's what changed the most. So that's more dark matter, a thousand genes that we don't really know what they do, but we know they're different between corn and teosinte. So I am ready to close sh up shop here. Um, so we can get these genes of large effect and get a picture of evolution that way. Uh, they're all transcription factors. Uh, and um, sometimes they change by regulatory changes to be either upregulated or downregulated. So once we had an amino acid change, importantly, it's a whole network of genes that are really being affected, not single genes in isolation. And we really can only see the tip of the iceberg. There's just a vast amount of change in the genome when you convert one species into another. So that's my current as opposed to groundbreaking uh, research done here at Madison. So thank you. <laughs> Millard. So John, when people do uh, hybrid corn, uh, what are they doing? Are they working again with uh, regulatory genes, or are they working with uh, structural genes? Yeah, so when Let's, when the modern breeders, you know, change hybrid corn, what are they actually fixing in that? I don't specifically know the answer to that. My expectation is that largely they're changing gene regulation. You know, that gene regulation is what's most important in controlling differences in that, uh, as opposed to protein functional differences. Showed the picture with you, Otis, your yeah. professor. Can you tell us a little bit about what his uh, contribution was in studying the evolution? Yeah, um, I didn't say anything about that. Uh, <clears throat> he was um, a taxonomic botanist, an evolutionist, and he got interested in that because his father was a biologist and studied corn, and so that's where his interest started. And then he was just reading the literature and he read the crazy theory of uh, the grandfather of a certain academic administrator at this university whose last name I won't mention, but, um, and, um, and that upset him to see this crazy theory being promulgated in the literature. And from his perspective as a taxonomist, the answer was clear. Teosinte was the ancestor of maize. And so he uh, wrote a paper making that claim from a taxonomic perspective. You know, just from the way a taxonomic botanist would look at this, say, it's clear, Teosinte is the ancestor of maize. Um, he wrote a uh, NSF grant to study it, and um, I was actually here on campus in the anthropology department, 
And um, he recruited me to join his lab and study corn instead of studying anthropology and study human genetics, which was my uh, lifelong desire, which never really happened. So, um, and so, uh, so that was his um, sort of uh, contribution, was the taxonomic one, you know, to saying that if you, Beetle looked at it as a geneticist, he looked at it as a taxonomist, that it, and said, Teosinte's got to be the ancestor, you know, based on taxonomic you know, approach. And it was, um, this is back in the 1970s, and it was, uh, there were a number of sort of uh, spirited conferences at which Hugh Iltis, George Beadle, and Paul Mangelsdorf uh, were all present. And so apparently they had some powerful debates. But um, uh, Beadle triumphed in the end. Um, and so his view of things, that it, it's, fully accepted by anybody who's competent to um, you know, study the data and come to a conclusion, so. Other questions? Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you.